Marvel Before the Dark Ages of Decompression and Activism, today on Attention Span Labs. Hello and welcome to another episode of Attention Span Labs. I'm your host, Mike, and joining me today are my wife and co-host, Shel Presto. Howdy, folks. And our friend, Steve. Hi, how you doing? And uh, we're all longtime comic book readers. We all started in the the 80s or 80s or 90s, and so what you see before you, besides uh, mine and Shell's two teenage superhero books, After Dark and Dismal Tide, in the middle, are two uh, 1991, I believe, issues of New Warriors, number eight, number nine. And I have them here because I want to talk about something that struck me when I reread these several months ago, uh, in comparison to the current state of uh, Marvel Comics in particular, but comic books in general. And one of the, the, the two things I want to talk, talk about primarily are that these were able to tell very complex, sophisticated stories with political elements uh, in a way that wasn't preachy or condemnatory or uh, taking a, a, a very a, 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 tendent, a tendentious activist position, the way they're so common uh, way it's so common in comics today, and also uh, to t that they were able to tell these sophisticated stories in a single issue. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So for those who don't know, the New Warriors uh, were one of my, besides being one of my favorite comics of, of the 90s, they're a, a group of uh, teenage, second or third, or maybe even fourth string superheroes, depending how you look at it. Um, who were all all of them except for their leader Night Thrasher uh, existed before in other comics. It was Namorito, who is uh, the Submariner's cousin, Firestar from Spider-Man: His Amazing Friends, um, Marvel Boy, who is the younger version of Van Astro, Guardians of the Galaxy, and and Nova or Kid Nova, Richard Rider, who was appeared in the seventies, and then uh, Speedball, who appeared as like a side character in I think. I believe Amazing Spider-Man Annual during the Evolutionary War, and uh, they were, you know, a group of, of kids banded together to fight crime, and basically under the the the, the guidance of their leader Night Thrasher, who's also a real jerk, but um, he basically wanted to forge them together for his one-man war against crime. Uh, but it's it's a and and make his one-man war against crime obviously like a six-man war against crime now. But um, so that's what they're about. It's actually pretty similar to our East End Irregulars books. Um, so if, if you like, um, not, not the plot points, but if you, if you like, uh, if you have fond memories of the New Warriors and, and stuff of, of these youngsters with superpowers trying to get a handle on their powers and what it means to be a hero and also just, you know, having to wrestle with the normal things of, uh, that you face when growing up, I think you'll like our books as well. But we're going to talk about issues uh, eight and nine. And I'll turn it over to Steve to give a, a, a recap of, of what actually happens in there. Okay, well, as you can see on the cover, there's two main storylines that are going on. The first one has to do with Punisher is in a confrontation with Night Thrasher, but it's, it's one of those ones where, you know, superhero meets superhero, and of course they have to fight before they discuss why they're actually fighting. So Punisher is actually after Shadow, um, silhouette. Silhouette. I'm sorry. Silhouette. Do you want to do that? Sa yeah. sa same thing. No. Same thing. Yeah. You go. Um, she is running from her past. Her brother was um, involved in the gangs, and she's taking refuge inside of a church. And Punisher has tracked her there. And I'm not really quite sure why Punisher is after her. He just it. it Pretty much, he just thinks she's bad because of her brother. But he, he's a Punisher, so that's he's the Punisher. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, he's 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 out to punish. So, um, of course, Night Thrasher wants to protect her, obviously. But while the Punisher is there chasing Silhouette, the priest that she meets inside of the church, he's sort of the other storyline there because he is being attacked by a costumed individual named Bangle. Bangle. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if you can see in there, he is the gentleman that sort of looks like a tiger. As you so, would expect. Yep, as you would expect if you have the name Bangle. So anyway, those that's the, the Punisher storyline going on there. He's chasing Silhouette, Night Thrasher's protecting her, but you have this element of 
the bangle who is actually after the priest for some reasons that come to light later on in the storyline he is just attacking the priest though and that's really all you know at this point um okay and then if we move on to the uh, yeah the second story the b story yep so then the other storyline has to do with um the amazon rainforest and deforestation down there um really a big issue going on uh, especially in the early 90s isn't even still today but um this storyline sort of gets put into play by Speedball is looking for his mother. She has sort of gone missing. She is an actress and she has joined um, these political activists sort of in the rainforest to, you know, protest what's going on down there. And they... They believe she's been kidnapped. Yes, yeah, so, uh, they believe she's been kidnapped, yeah. But she's actually there uh, out of her own volition. She is right. there... Um, I actually I think later on in the book they reveal that she's kind of there because she she wanted to feel important again like she wasn't right. her acting career was like you know st stalling or something right which is a very interesting point and I want to come back to that later but can, please continue yep so so they um, Speedball gets everyone together because he's like well hey my my mom's been kidnapped we gotta go we gotta go rescue her so they go down there but then they run into a uh, force of nature. Which is a awesome, awesomely <laughs> '90s, awesomely '90s um, uh, group of villains. They have crazy '90s armor, pouches galore, <laughs> funny names as well. Um, but Force of Nature, they have one woman has uh, fire. Uh, then there's a guy with air, a guy yeah. with water, and then the they're all, uh, plant guy. Yeah, he's actually like a plant guy. Like I, he's well, a sentient that, plant. That, he's that, a sentient that's plant. Quote Earth. They're <laughs> missing heart because they're the bad that, guys. Yes. <laughs> they, yes, they have no heart. That's a that's a Captain Planet reference to those who are too young to understand. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So um, of course they have to get in a fight with 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 them down there. But uh, Force of Nature is actually being employed by the. Um, I don't want to call them terrorists, but they're the well. The, they're I mean, terrorists the because terrorists? The, yeah. they're terrorists because their methods go beyond the the usual uh, protester. Yeah. yeah, it was. They were really the group of protesters that Speedball's mom is with, but they are really not protesters. They're actually bad guys. They're the bad guys. And here, here's an ad for that that very awful, that notoriously bad Silver Surfer game for the Nintendo. By the way, I just thought I'd show you that. <laughs> But I, yeah, I think, th thank you, Steve. I think that's, that's a good point to talk about what, um, to go back to the, or the my, my main reason I want to talk about this is, is one, there's a lot of story going on here. And I know I said you could tell on one issue, but um, yes, it's it's a two-part issue. Actually, I, I think it's actually three parts. But the interesting thing is these are two very large, significant stories with sophisticated emotional uh, stakes. They're, 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 they're very, they're, they're, um, they're touching on social issues. Um, they're, they're touching on, uh, ambiguous, um, moral conflicts to doing a lot of stuff, uh, two, two main stories. And actually, as we'll see a little bit later on, two smaller stories that are building up in the span of two issues. Um, so one, that's something you just don't see anymore with, uh, thanks to the Brian Michael Bendis era of decompression, where a story goes on for six months, sometimes eight months or more, and nothing ever happens. Um, in every issue here, even though the story's not resolved, there's a fight, there's high stakes, they meet them, there's some sort of twist or complication. Um, and it, it really holds your interest in all four. May I remind everyone, one dollar. One dollar, not four dollars, five dollars, like you see today. Um, and so this is before the era of trades where everything was packaged for a, uh, a, a six-issue a six issue story arc, where... Uh, increasingly nowadays you, re you read the first two or three issues you're not even sure what it's about and, and the other thing uh, as was brought up there's there's a couple there's some uh, high high intensity political issues here the uh, the argument often made by um, SJW types and their defenders uh, in the modern age is that comics were always political and they refer to absurd examples like, you know, Captain America punching Hitler, which is someone that, of course, everyone agrees with, you know, including other bad guys like Stalin, right? And, and, and you know, if he punched Stalin, Hitler would agree with that too. So th these are not these are not like really fraught political issues where large sections of the population are going to disagree with them, and then it's your 
uh, um, assumed responsibility as a comic book artist or writer to demonize, say, half of the United States because they voted for Bad Orange Man, right? So the other example are, are stories like this, where yes, they were political. We're talking about, in one case, um, the aftermath of, of, in the Ninth Rasher Punisher story, the, the aftermath of Vietnam and uh, war crimes committed there, because that's, that's sort of the, the twist of the issue that's revealed in, um, I believe, in, in this one, that the, the priest is a war criminal. Uh, sort of, or whether he's, he does he does it, in, I guess you could look at it either way. But whether he do, did it intentionally or not, he he killed Bengal's family, uh, who were innocent civilians, and he comes back to take his revenge on him. So there's this whole plot there of, of and but the priest at the same time is is his well he's repentant he's That's, repentant yeah. he comes back to America and then it, he goes immediately into the priesthood and he goes to underserved parts of yeah. the city and that's where he's at when we meet him actually and that's where where silhouette runs into the um into the church but it's very yeah it's morally ambiguous because one it's vietnam and i think what does the bangle keeps repeating he's like um and this was something i had to i had to like look up it was like the i heard the jungle breathe or mm -hmm. the jungle's breathing or something he keeps yeah. saying that but that's what that's what the army officers they said they heard you know right and they thought they were about to be ambushed to be, yeah they right. thought the Cong were going to come out and kill them so then they just started shooting and they shot the innocents and right. you know so then you're like oh my god but then the, the the thing that i guess is actually the kicker is that so um bangle is a child he is looking for the u.s military people to save him and they leave him there and that's really the right the, you know, yeah, the, he, he was he was trying to cling to the helicopter to to be saved, and, and they actually the, push him out. Yeah, the, they like the push priest him right off. Yeah. push pushes him off. Yeah, which doesn't condemn him to death per se, but leaves him in a really crappy situation without a family, without to, family take to take care, care of him, right. and in the middle of a war torn country. And the, I mean, the big thing is the. The priest feels bad about it, and he's spent the past, we'll say, decade of his life 20, trying 20 to years, do, yeah. trying to do good and make up for it. So, if he he was obviously not a good man back then, but he is a good man now, presumably. So, of course, th this is as anyone I think will agree, this is intensely political, but it's also um, it reaches into the depths of a story that that resonates with the human soul of 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 evil and giving into evil and and redemption and showing mercy. Um, in, in, in both cases, that priest refused, did not show mercy to this, this child, and now the child has, has welled up the sense of, of, of uh, righteous outrage, um, and he, he's, seeking, he's seeking vengeance. And then there's the question of, is, 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 it, is vengeance good? How, how has it, um, is it, is it really justice? Um, and is it justice if the man has repented and has um, you know, sought, sought to, to remake his life? That's almost like an underlying of any Punisher. If Punisher's right. in something, that <laughs> you, you of have course, that. Punisher yeah. being a veteran of the Vietnam War, lot, lots of his stories go back to to that. And, and with Punisher, especially, you get the one. I'm a Vietnam Vietnam veteran, so I understand that you know this kind of stuff That's happens. Yeah. And the other thing is, Punisher's on a huge revenge bender himself o yes. over yep. his family getting accidentally killed. But so, it, oh, he's it, right smack in the middle of this morally. Interestingly, I, it's been a while since I've read it, but I believe like Punisher sort of stands out of the way, and he's like, if 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 Bengal wants to kill this guy, then he probably deserves to, to get it, right? Yeah, he does. He actually stands there. That was one of the things that I said uh, earlier. Was I was like, it seemed out of the out of maybe not. Now that you mention it like that, though, uh, I thought out of character for Punisher to not punish somebody. Right, You're right. He actually, does take action. His yeah, own he, hands, he doesn't yeah. punish somebody. He he says, "Well, you know, hey, look, you got beef. You guys settle it." Right, you know, type thing. But um, yeah, I don't know. And and Punisher then also has the uh, connection then with Night Thrasher, where you know Night Thrasher says about how his family died, right. and then you know Punisher comes out and says, "Well, that's why I'm doing this same, same thing." Same thing. Now, Night Thrasher is actually in the same moral arena as Punisher with this right. because Night Thrasher's parents were killed, but he's... He, he usually doesn't use lethal weapons. He he does some... He will, I guess, but... Right. But he, the other thing is he he just owes the priest one because the priest is watching over his girlfriend. Right. That's so, true. 
He also has a skateboard with a crazy, uh, like, razor knife in the end of it. And, and it's a bulletproof is... skateboard he uses as a shield, which I yep. think is actually kind of a cool idea. Yeah, that's 90s as, as all heck, though. Yeah, right? it sure is. That's it 90s sure is. As, as, as anything. So, so yes, this is, this is a really political story, but it's also, like, an incredibly uh, deep story that, frankly, you wouldn't expect to find in, in comic books. They're, they're, these are well-rounded char- characters that have flaws, and they have good points too. And they have, there's questions of, of, of they're trying to redeem themselves, but can they? Should, should they? should they be left the hook or, or should, um, does vengeance, does fulfilling vengeance solve you, uh, sol- solve your problems? Um, and this is, uh, this is it's a very humanizing story. Everybody involved in this is a human. No one is a, is a cardboard cutout character that is meant to be, uh, to be ridiculed um, or, 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 or demonized. So one of the complaints that people have today that about you know politics, political issues in comics, which are are primarily um, with a social social justice agenda, a, a far left progressive agenda, um, an anti-Trump uh, conservatives are bad kind of thing is they're reacting to that. They're not reacting to the the actual existence of political issues, but the the making things out to be one dimensional, painting um, their your your enemies um, your countrymen as your neighbors and family members even as evil because they don't agree with you on whatever your latest talking point is and this story does not have anything like that again everybody's very humanized there's a very um there's very human elements everything everybody has their flaws everybody has has good points to an an, an art somebody everybody has an argument about it right well the the Big striking thing about these books is that the characters don't try to decide what's right and wrong. They understand the issues are too complex and too nuanced, and they can't, you know, like in the the rainforest storyline, they're like, well, we can't save the entire rainforest, and we can't change the, is it Brazilian? Yeah. The Brazilian government. But we can save lives right now. Now, yes. So it's, 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 there's ambiguity, but there's not nihilism. There's not the moral. There's not the, the nihilistic position that nothing matters. There's no such thing as right or wrong or good or evil. It never takes that position at all. I think then in these books too, they were really trying to make it very digestible. Um, so it's it's presented in a way that's easily understood for a child. And I, I want to say a child, but anybody a, reading, a younger reader, a younger yeah. reader, you you can get what's going on. And like Michelle said the issues actually seem bigger than the teenagers, right? And they, they kind of get that. And that's one of the, the kind of the hooks of the book, right? They're teenagers and they're like trying to figure out, well, where do we fit in the world? And these are big worldly issues. Right. What do we do? Well, hey, look, we know we can, we can not really fix things, but we can save some people where we're at. Yeah, and that was a cool thing. They're, and, they're, and they're dealing with issues that, frankly, they can't punch or blast their way out of, right? They're dealing with the loss of somebody's family. They're dealing with, uh, um, you know, the ecological destruction. Uh, they're, they're, they're dealing with also the, uh, one point brought up a counterpoint to the the, the very the very popular at the time position of we got to save the rainforest was, I, I think it's Namorita, I, I, I could be wrong, but one of them says, listen, these the people that, that are cutting down the trees and... and um, they're doing it because they're they're trying to farm and grow food, and they have to live too. And what are we going to do about them? So these are all very complicated issues that that are not um, they're not um, solvable by any sort of uh, powers or use of force, and and uh, which is a very a contrary message to what you see in the modern social justice activists, where they actually are using force to force people to think and act a certain way. Um, instead, these heroes sort of realize that they're they're out of their element a bit, and but they want to do the right thing. And what they can do is they can fight um, people who are doing very obviously wrong things, like uh, trying to kill other people, trying to blow up other people's property, um, k- kidnapping, and, and, and so forth. So in, in the... In the rainforest story with Speedball's mom, as it turns out, she's not she's not kidnapped, and um, she she actually um, it was it was kind of her her idea to work with these people. And as Steve mentioned before, one of the the things that that's driving her is the sense that you know she feels useless. Her career is on the downturn. Um, she wants to be important again. She wants to achieve something and get back in the limelight, which 
I think is is exactly what we see today um, with so many celebrities taking their very brave positions that, of course, are the same opinions that everybody else that they work with has. So they're not, it's not brave at all. They're not risking anything, not risking their careers um, by saying orange man bad. They're not risking their careers by, um, you know, embracing uh, transgenderism or or rainbow pride month or, or whatever they're actually but but they're what they're they're virtue signaling and sort of speedball's mom actually is is doing virtue signaling and she's also she contrives this this uh scenario where she's like fake kidnapped um which i think interestingly goes along with a, a lot of the 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 um the false hate crimes that we've been seeing over the last couple of years you know the most notorious one is probably the that actor from empire Jussie Smollett, right? Who, uh, you know, basically <laughs> he basically conceded that he made it up, but without saying that right. he did. Yeah, yeah, that was horrible. So yeah. the so she basically engineers this this kidnapping of herself, right? And then her son comes to rescue her, and you know she was in on it all along. And in the long run, though, they actually were going to kill her anyway. They were going yeah. to kill her, <laughs> which is you're like, oh my god, oh no. And which kind of again, there's another there's another parallel there that you know the SJWs always eat, yeah, eat each it, other. They're like it, like they turn on J.K. Rowling most recently for her. And it's worth noting that like you know, in and of itself. You know the 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 quote unquote trying to save the rainforest isn't necessarily a bad you know no not a at bad all. thing to try to do. It's just you know she she may have started with very good intention. She may have started thinking she could make a difference, but as things start going downhill, she stays in. It's like right. oh you know I want to help the rainforest. Well that's great. Well we want to stage a big public kidnapping of you and make all these lies and try to <laughs> yeah. make the the you know. Uh, rainforest uh, developers and the rubber tappers and stuff look bad. It's like, well, that sounds really illegal and bad and misleading, but okay, because well, anyway. it's yeah. for the rainforest. <laughs> and and, yeah. th and th that's the th that's that... right up until the point where they pull a gun on her and right. say, "Well, you had to die for this cause." Right. Yeah. yeah, and of course, she's not really willing to die for her cause after all. Yeah, definitely not. No, uh, and I think that that right there um, zeroes in on the though there's these complex issues with multiple you know it's it's, it's right to save the rainforest but it's also right for people to grow their own food and so forth and but the that's where the moral ambiguity comes in but what where there is no moral ambiguity is ultimately right and wrong and it this does not take a the, the bad guys in this uh take an ends justify the means uh p position and the heroes, on the other hand, say the ends do not justify the means. The ends have to be good, and the means have to be good. And that is a very heroic position that I think is is missing in comics today that are, are uh, far, far short of actual heroic characters. So the discussion went on, but right here is where we're going to cut the video into two parts. Uh, we have about another 20 minutes to a half hour of... of Excellent discussion that goes into uh, slightly off-topic areas of of the of decompression. How uh, comic studios might handle things better as uh, f fully packaged trade paperbacks instead of releasing uh, month by month uh, Elseworlds characters, and how to introduce uh, how to make new versions of, of classic characters without uh, upending the fandom, uh, and a lot of other uh, great topics. But that'll be in a forthcoming video that we'll post probably within the next week. So I wanted to stop here to, to ask you all to, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Please share it with your friends and uh, subscribe uh, if you're not already subscribed. I also wanted to talk to you briefly about our new project, HeroicAdventureFiction.com. And uh, it's a way for you to read uh, some of our titles al already that, that are, that are uh, some of the titles that are published. You can go to our website and read the actual books there. Uh, some of the books we have the, uh, the full text there. Others we have the first few chapters. And we will eventually be, be adding them all. But uh, we figured it was a good way to, to bring more attention to ourselves and hopefully increase our mind share. We talk a lot about our books in this channel and the things that inspire us. And... Uh, I really think that you guys will like it if, you, if you're if you able to, to get on there and read it. So we wanted to offer them up uh, for, for free uh, on our website. Again, that's heroicadventurefiction.com. So please check that out. Uh, if you enjoy it, you can, uh, you can subscribe. 
and we'll be posting more stories as the weeks go on, including exclusive content for members only. And then you can also, uh, if you don't want to wait to finish the stories, you can go out and buy our books very affordably at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or at any other fine book retailers. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and we hope to see you back here for part two. This is Mike from Attention Span Labs, signing off. Thank you.